Broadcasting live from Business Radio X, it's time for Coach the Coach. Welcome to Coach the Coach Radio. Stone Payton here with you this afternoon, and you are in for a real treat. We have with us today, please join me in welcoming to the broadcast, disaster avoidance expert and author of Never Go With Your Gut, Mr. Gleb Sapersky. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you so very much for having me on. It's a pleasure to be on Coach the Coaches. Well, I got to tell you, what a uh, compelling title, moniker, disaster avoidance expert. Tell us a little bit about your work, mission, purpose. What are you out there trying to do for folks? Sure. So for coaches, I I do coaching for business leaders. And for business leaders, I help them avoid decision disasters. So business leaders are decision makers, that's their title, but they never get actual professional development in decision making. And by going with their gut, which is very typical advice that they get, they often run into disastrous situations as a result of poor decisions. I mean, if you look at, let's say, entrepreneurs, you look at all small businesses, startups that open up, about half of them fail in five years and two-thirds of them fail in 10 years. So that's pretty bad. And of course, big business leaders, you look at what's happening in Boeing right now where they made some terrible decisions about the 737 MAX. So bad decisions happen at the top and at the bottom level and everywhere in the middle. Now, so that's what I do for business leaders. For coaches, I help them, talk, teach them how to help their clients make the best decisions. So I'm a WBEX presenter. I have a presentation coming up actually in mid-December. I talk to International Coach Federation groups often. I have a class on coaching analytically minded clients. So I do a lot of content creation for coaches as well. So what was the impetus for this kind of work, man? Did you make a bucket full of bad decisions? <laughs> <laughs> well, the impetus was actually my parents making some bad decisions when I was a kid. So I saw them fighting with each other about pretty stupid stuff, you know, just regular domestic things and some actually big stuff. My dad made a really bad, and he was always someone who went with his gut, you know, just how he felt a certain way and he went with it. So he was a real estate agent and had variable income. And then at some point he hid some money from my mom when he had a good year, bought an apartment elsewhere, leased it out, whatever, and to other people. And Once my mom found out a couple of years later, it was a real big blowout fight. They separated for a while and, uh, you know, they eventually got back together, but it was never the same again. They she didn't really trust them again. So that really shaped my childhood and seeing the kind of bad decisions that people made in their personal financial life. I saw the same sort of bad decision making in business leadership. I came of age during the dot com boom and bust when really good business leaders, supposedly good business leaders, lost a great deal of money in the dot-com bust and also made some terrible decisions about fraudulent accounting to hide their losses at Enron, WorldCom, and Tyco. So having come of age in that period, I saw some really bad decisions that were made by very prominent people. And so I decided to study this stuff. I became a coach, consultant, trainer with the company Disaster Avoidance Experts, which I founded later, as well as a scholar. So I spent over 15 years in academia as a cognitive neuroscientist and behavioral economist, learning about why people make bad decisions and how we can address their bad decision making. Okay, so then there is some some science behind this idea of, of why it's not a good idea to go with your gut? Yes, this is all based on science. So the typical advice, the intuitive advice is to go with your gut. You're comfortable with a certain decision, you go with that decision. That's the, that's what the people traditionally advise you to do. However, we've had a lot of recent research in recent decades, and that's actually the last few years, on what are called cognitive biases. Now, cognitive biases are the dangerous judgment errors we all as human beings make just because of how our brains are wired. Our gut reactions, our instincts, our intuitions, they're not adapted for the modern business environment. I mean, the modern business environment has only been around since World War II. Our intuitions, our gut reactions are actually adapted for the savanna environment when we were hunters and foragers living in small tribes. So they're good to follow the, what's comfortable and what's intuitive if we live in small tribes in the you know, African savanna right now, but most of us do not live in that <laughs> environment. We live in the modern business world, right? So we, the intuition for us is to be tribal to like people like us, to go with people who are like us. That's why 
business leaders make terrible decisions in hiring others who are like themselves, and then they make decisions that they don't have any real external output, external feedback in making decisions. So they make really bad decisions because of that. They make really bad decisions because of tribalism and them trying to cr climb to the top of the social hierarchy in a tribe, which was really important in Savannah. In the current business environment, it really hurts organizations in three years to try to do that. So that's a really bad problem. And then, of course, the fight or flight response, the saber-toothed tiger response. Now, it was very good for our ancestors to jump at 100 shadows and get away from the saber-toothed tiger. <laughs> that was good. In the modern world, there are many, many less saber-toothed tigers, I have to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> so right now, reacting to external threats as though they're saber-toothed tigers, you know, if somebody gives you constructive critical feedback and you, sh you, know, you ignore that person or you shout back, you know, that's not right, that's not, the, that's not how I'm behaving, that's really bad in the modern business environment. But people tend to do that all the time. I mean, how many times in businesses have you seen the, have you seen shooting the messenger where someone gives you important information from somewhere down the chain and the leader criticizes that person, shoots them down, ignores that information, and that destroys good companies? That's one of the things that really led down Boeing in recent years. So that's, that's what happens. And we tend to make really bad decisions because of our gut reactions. And that's the cognitive neuroscience has shown that there are so many dangerous judgment errors, cognitive biases that we engage in because we tend to go with our gut as opposed to listening to our head. So you briefly mentioned Boeing, but I suspect with you, the way that you have your antenna up and your radar on, you probably never run out of current examples of exactly <laughs> what you're describing, right? Absolutely. So another current example is WeWork. Now look at what happened. That company was in the beginning of 2019 value, valued at about $75 billion. That's $75 billion. Right now it's valued of, you know, at the end of 2019, it's valued at about $7 billion. $7 billion. That's an order of magnitude difference. That's 70 billion, just nearly $70 billion of value loss. Why did that happen? Well, because Adam Newman, the founder of WeWork, was really pushing for an initial public offering, IPO. And a lot of people told him that he shouldn't do that. SoftBank and other backers told him he shouldn't do that. But he pushed for it anyway. Once external investors investigated what was happening at WeWork, they saw that there was a lot of double dealing, self-dealing, where Adam Newman owned properties and then he leased them to WeWork, which is a big no-no. And he set up a really screwy governance structure where, for example, he had shares that were worth 10 votes and he was willing going to sell shares that were worth one vote. So he was trying to retain power at the top of the social hierarchy, which is a very tribal thing to do. And that's not really good at all for the modern business environment to try to control that power at the very top. So basically, the investors lost trust in the leadership. They saw that he was not a good leader, and they and the valuation of the company was a great deal of it was dependent on the leadership, the vision of the leadership. And that's why the valuation of the company went from seventy five billion to seven billion. <laughs> <laughs> Now, when you first started introducing this idea in your in your speaking, in your writing, in your consulting, your coaching, did people embrace it pretty quickly, or did you meet with with quite a bit of resistance early on? Oh, I met with quite a bit of resistance, especially coaches who are very uh, sensitive, emotional, intuitive, and try to say, "Hey, you know, I try to tell my co my clients to go with their intuitions. I ask them questions, and they discover things using the questioning methods or and so on." However, once we started talking about the situations, they saw that there's so many situations where telling the clients to follow their intuitions led to really bad outcomes for the client. And I guided them through some examples where, hey, here's a client, you know, you told them to go with your intuitions and in hiring uh, some employees. And then when the client hires employees, we have a lot of research studies showing that when somebody goes with their intuitions by in hiring employees, they hire people who are like themselves. That really harms diversity, which is one sort of set of issues. And that also harms judgment, because when you have a lot of people with the same thinking patterns on the team, which is what you get to hire when you hire with your intuitions, then you make really bad decisions because you don't have any external input. You basically reinforce your each other's weaknesses without you know, adding to each other's strengths if you hire the same people 
for decision making. So that's both diversity and decision making are greatly harmed when you tell people to follow their intuitions in their hiring. The same thing when you tell people to follow their intuitions in, let's say, their career choices. Very often, people are greatly overcome. Leaders, there's extensive research showing that leaders tend to be way too optimistic and way too overconfident in their career choices. They need to be much less confident. They need to develop much more humility and much more ability to change their mind at, during their career choices, in making their career choices. And if you don't tell them that as a coach, if you don't give them this research-based, evidence-based perspective, you are letting them down. You're being a very bad coach. You're harming your client. And once I talked to coaches and gave them situations in their own life, in their own coaching uh, practice that showed them, hey, yes, this is a mistake. This, you know, I should really be much more analytical and use evidence in how I coach people. They were much more willing to accept that they need to tell their clients to listen to their heads as opposed to simply going with their, with their gut. Now, does this same science, this same um, human frailty find itself, its head popping up on like um, traditional approaches to evaluating the situation, like the, like a, a SWOT analysis, a market as, assessment? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, some of these same challenges can, can happen there too, right? That's right. So when you, as a coach, are facilitating a group, there's a lot of coaches and consultants who use the SWOT analysis to facilitate groups. And I've been asked to write for Inc. Magazine, and I've written an article about how the SWOT analysis is actually a pretty bad, bad strategic analysis because, again, of the overconfidence and the overoptimism. Now, the overconfidence, that's an overconfidence bias. So that's one of the cognitive biases that I've been talking about. We have research showing that when people say they're 100% confident about something, they're actually right 80% of the time. So if somebody bets the company, bets the career, you know, choice, that's 100%, they're only, they're going to lose their career, their company 20% of the time. That's pretty horrible for calculations. <laughs> if you make that, you know, if you make that bet once a year, then you will very likely within five years, lose the company and we see that mm -hmm. you know half of all startups fail within five years there's a reason they do that so that's kind of uh, that's the confidence bias overconfidence bias the other is the optimism bias where people tend to be greatly optimistic they feel that they have gotten to where they are because they're good because they are leaders they're wise and therefore they have excessively high opinions of their judgments and decision making as a coach you need to bring them down so <laughs> in the SWOT analysis that's the problem with the SWOT analysis that I've seen way, way, way too often is that leaders tend to <clears throat> list way too many strengths and way too many opportunities, not nearly enough weaknesses, not nearly enough threats, because their gut intuitions, they are very uncomfortable. They feel bad about admitting that they have weaknesses. They feel bad admitting <clears throat> that their organizations or their careers, whatever you're setting, has threats. So therefore, they tend to underestimate those greatly, and they tend to overestimate trends and opportunities greatly for the same reasons. So when I've seen, when I engage with clients and they show me their previous SWOT analysis, I say, hey, what about these opportunities, what about these threats that you're not considering? And they're like, um, hmm, <laughs> yeah, okay. And what about these weaknesses that you're not considering? The, yeah, and, that ha and they eventually acknowledge it. But it takes a lot of effort and it takes time to be a good coach and to be a quality coach and to get the client to face their weaknesses and their threats. And the SWOT analysis provides a false sense of comfort and security to leaders and coaches who use it with their clients without specifically addressing the overconfidence bias and the optimism bias. Now, you're not soft in your language or your framing at all. You specifically use the word disaster and talk in terms of disaster avoidance. That suggests to me that not only is the risk of failure higher than I think most of us recognize, as you were describing a moment ago, but the stakes are really high. The price of failure, I mean, it's prohibitive in many of these cases. It is very high and very problematic. I mean, in any sort of when let's go back, back to the startups. If your startup fails and uh, half of all startups fail within two within five years and two thirds of them fail within so within a decade, most people invest a great deal of their money, their life savings into a startup. And if it fails, 
they lose a lot of money. I've seen so many entrepreneurs. I mean, there are so many coaches who coach entrepreneurs and who tell them to go for it, go ahead, you know, support whatever, go for the startup plans. And the coaches give them really bad advice because these people lose their life savings. And then what are, where do they go? That's a really bad strategy. You need to be much more skeptical, much more pessimistic. You need to say, hey, here are the base rates. Here is what's likely to happen. If most people who start small businesses, the, who start uh, new enterprises, they think they're smart. They think they're confident and they are confident, but they lose their shirts. So why do you think you won't lose your shirt? You need to be much more risk oriented, much more skeptical about your own ability to not lose your shirt in <laughs> small enterprises. And that is what happens in small enterprises, of course, in large ones. I mean, there was a study uh, done of large companies that were worth over 500 million that went bankrupt between 2001 and uh, between uh, Yes, 2000, 1981 and 2007. There were 423 companies that went bankrupt in the U.S. When the study scholars who are behavioral economists, Chunkamui, and uh, looked at, so that's the name if you want to look at the study, when they looked at why these companies failed, 46% of the reasons for the bankruptcy of these companies came from bad strategic decisions by the leadership. That's 46%. It wasn't external causes. It wasn't kind of, you know, something about the situation. It was purely bad decision-making by the leadership. It was a disaster of decision-making, 46%. In many of the other cases, the bankruptcy would likely not have happened if the leadership made better decisions. So a lot of it was dependent on the rest of the 54% was dependent to some extent on bad decisions. 46% came purely from bad decisions. These are terrible disasters. Coaches who are who are permitting their clients to make such decisions and telling them to go with their gut, their intuitions, not using evidence-based strategies are failing. They're being unethical. They need to go <laughs> and actually study what is the evidence and how do we as human beings make bad decisions? How can we make better decisions? Otherwise, they're failing as coaches. So out of this research, out of this experience, you've actually crafted some I don't know, maybe the right word is methodology, some structure, some rigor, some discipline, some best practices to, to, to address these issues, yes? That's right. So the easiest thing that I give to all of my clients, both people who are the business leaders and for coaches who I work with to help them help their clients, I give them easy tips, easy strategies to use. So, for example, for any decision, here's a very quick technique, takes only a couple of minutes to use for anybody these are five questions that you want to ask to avoid decision disasters. Now, these are five questions. Let me go through them one by one. First, what important information did I not yet fully consider? Again, what important information did I not yet fully consider? This is incredibly important because we tend to flinch away from information about our weaknesses and our threats to us. So things that we don't want to consider, things that make us uncomfortable. In order to grow, and we need to be uncomfortable. In order to acknowledge information that is not comfortable to us, we need to look at information that we didn't consider about the decision. So that's one. Second, what dangerous judgment errors, cognitive biases, did I not yet address? Again, what dangerous judgment errors did I not yet address? My book, Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters, Go through the 30 most dangerous ones for businesses and how to address them. Or you can check out the 100 cognitive bias, over 100 cognitive biases on Wikipedia. It doesn't talk about addressing them. It just talks about what they are. Then, what would a trusted and objective advisor suggest I do? So again, what would a trusted and objective advisor suggest I do? Think about who's a trusted and objective advisor to you. What would they suggest that you do? What would and do the same thing for the business leader? You know, Have them call you or have them turn to a peer or a mentor who they trust. Next, third, uh, so forth. How have I addressed all the ways this could fail? Again, how have I addressed all the ways this could fail? An especially useful technique here is to imagine that the decision has failed, whatever decision you're doing completely failed. It could have failed. The next step is to think about all the reasons why it plausibly could have failed and then address them in advance. And think about all these reasons. You know, you're switching a job. Why could this fail? Or you're trying going for a promotion. Why could this fail? You're launching a new product. Why would it fail? You're moving to a new headquarters. Why would that fail? 
and think about all the reasons why it could fail and address them in advance. Finally, and really importantly, what new information would cause me to revisit this decision? Again, what new information would cause me to change my mind, revisit this decision? This is very important to address in advance of the decision itself, because when you're implementing the decision, when you're in the heat of the moment, it's very hard for you to look back and think about, hey, here's how I'll change things. Now, one of the things I hear people ask me about this is, hey, does this slow down decision making? And of course, it slows down decision making by you know a couple of minutes, but it's so much mm -hmm. worth it to not have to pay many, many, many hours if you make the bad decisions. That's first. Second, there's been a lot of research showing that these kinds of questions, once you get used to asking them, they don't slow you down at all. So firefighters in the UK have been using these sorts of questions to actually address their decision making in the heat of the moment, literally during <laughs> a fire. And they have been shown to, A, not make decisions that are slower. Their decision making is about as fast when they use these type of questions. And B, their decision making is much better when they use these types of questions to actually put out fires. So you're actually putting out a fire. And business, most business decisions have much more time than if you're putting out a fire. Well, that suggests to me then that these muscles, if you will, can be exercised, right? If we if we practice exercising these disciplines and over time, we can get better and better at it. That's right. So this is a specific practice called mental fitness. We talk a lot about physical fitness and how we can grow stronger, go to the gym and so on. And that's something that we already get used to, physical fitness. Now, the mind is a muscle, just just like any other muscle. But we don't think about mental fitness. We don't think about exercising our mind as something we should do deliberately. And by using this strategy, but however, there's extensive research showing that by if we get used to building up a certain mental habit, you know, think about a physical habit like brushing your teeth. Right now, that's an automatic thing. You brush your teeth, you get up, you brush your teeth. Or the habit of eating with your fork and knife, right? You're not eating with your hands most times. You're eating with a fork and knife. These are physical habits that you've built up. You can build up mental habits in exactly the same way, habits of patterns of thought. So you can integrate these five questions to avoid decision disasters into your everyday habits of thought. And while at the start, it takes a little bit of time, just like it took time to learn how to brush your teeth and to eat with your fork or any other habit that you develop, once you develop this habit of asking these questions and getting your clients to ask these questions, it doesn't take any time at all. Okay, let's talk about this this new book, and it is Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters. Did this book come together pretty easily for you? Did you, did you struggle with it? Tell us a little bit about that process. Yeah, the book came together actually relatively easily. What I did, I, I'm a prominent writer, so I write for Time, I write for Fast Company, for Inc. Magazine, Psychology Today, The Conversation, Scientific American, Business Insider, venues like this. So I'm well known as a writer and I have a lot of articles out there and uh, a lot of folks who know me. And so what I did was I took a lot of the writing the ideas that I've done and what I do in the, all of my writing is I take case studies from my own coaching and consulting experience, training experience, and I write them up. Here's an example. Here's a cognitive bias that I saw. Here's how we addressed it in the moment. And so I took a bunch of those and said, hey, what are the essential ideas here? What are the most important case studies that I can take out? I took out the most important case studies by my, based on my experience. I took out all a bunch of techniques that I developed based on the latest research and how do you actually address, overcome cognitive biases. And I put them together into a book along with an assessment that anyone who takes the book can use for their clients to, of how to address cognitive biases, which is chapter seven. So the book is structured in a very simple manner. You start with the broad framework of why we should not go simply go with our gut, why we should instead check with our head before going with our gut. So <laughs> all the principles, all the underlying decision-making principles. And then it goes, each chapter goes through the kind of dangerous judgment errors, the 30 most dangerous judgment errors that business leaders make and how you can address them with specific illustrative case studies from my consulting and coaching, as well as broader case studies like I mentioned Equif like I mentioned the uh, WeWork, Boeing, Equifax disaster with a cyber attack hack and their very poor response to it, and many other examples like this one, Elon Musk and 
the Tesla and so on. And finally, uh, you have the assessment, so you can assess how vulnerable you are and how vulnerable your clients are, mainly for coaches, they can assess how vulnerable their clients are to which decision-making errors, to which cognitive biases are they vulnerable and how you can address each one effectively. And that's how the book came about. And then it actually got really uh, surprisingly good endorsement. So Marshall Goldsmith, who's one of the most prominent coaches in the world, has endorsed it, and some of our other 57 other thought leaders and business leaders. So I'm very pleased about all the endorsements, folks who say that this is a really innovative, it's the first book to address cognitive biases in business leadership. So the folks think it's a really innovative book and very important, and it will you know, hopefully have a positive impact on the world. Well, I would certainly think so, and it must be very rewarding to get that kind of feedback from your peers and other heavy hitters in in the arena. So congratulations on that. And it's certainly already beginning to have an impact on on us and, and our listeners. I look forward to, to sharing this as we publish this interview. Before we wrap, talk a little bit about your work with other coaches because that strikes me as the as the big lever, right? The 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 great way to to get this this work out there to the to the most people in the least amount of time with the biggest impact impact so speak to that a little bit before we wrap sure so coaching the coaches of course is the most biggest impact i can make because my the people i coach can uh, help others as well and actually i have a class coaching the analytical mind which you can just google coaching the analytical mind and you can take the class that's icf approved gives 12 credits i was actually talking to somebody who was taking the class as part of the class i do uh coaching sessions for the coaches who take the class. I was talking to them, uh, to someone from Europe about who is taking the class from uh, Netherlands, I believe. And he was telling me as part of the session that I had with him how useful it was and how he really didn't consider one of the cognitive biases that uh, he suffered from, which is called the false consensus effect. Now, the false consensus effect refers to the fact that we assume other people to be like ourselves much more than is actually the case. Again, we assume other people to be like ourselves, to have our values, our thought patterns, much more than is actually the case. So one of the things that coaches frequently make mistakes in is the emotional aspects of things. Emotions are very important in decision-making. They drive about 80 to 90% of our decisions. And most coaches tend to be quite in touch with their emotions. And that's a good thing. Most coaches tend to be emotionally intelligent. Now, and that's very important for them to realize most clients who client who coaches coach tend to be not very emotionally intelligent. They tend to be much more analytical and they need to be given evidence in the form that coaches don't really, aren't really used to that they need to be given specific case studies. They need to be given research, especially if these, if the clients come from fields like finance or, you know, doctors and so on, they need lawyers, they need to be given specific types of evidence that coaches don't really, aren't really used to giving, aren't really used to conveying, and they are not uh, good for the just questioning method. So that's one of the things I talk about. And there are so many other things that coaches miss about coaching analytically minded people. And so that's the, what the course is about, coaching the local mind. I'm presenting a WBEX about this topic in, uh, I think, a couple of weeks, mid-December. So you can check that out. And uh, I present to international coaching federation groups and other coaching groups often. So if you want me to present to your group, shoot me an email, gleb at disasteravoidanceexperts.com. Again, gleb at disasteravoidanceexperts.com. Well, Dr. Gleb Sapersky, it has been an absolute delight having you on the show. Congratulations on the momentum. Keep up the good work. Please keep us posted here at the Business Radio X Network. Uh, there's, I'm sure, a great deal more to come from you and your work, and we want to make sure that we're following it. One more time before we wrap, best coordinates for someone to reach out if they want to have a conversation with you or somebody on your team about any of these topics. Sure. So first of all, you can all get in the book, Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters. At any bookstore anywhere, it's published by the Career Press, so good traditional publisher. So it's available in physical bookstores everywhere, as well as, of course, online and Barnes and & Noble and Amazon, everywhere like that. You can check out my work at disasteravoidanceexperts.com. Again, disasteravoidanceexperts.com. And for the class on coaching the analytical mind, it'll be disasteravoidance 
experts.com/coaching-analytical or you can just google coaching that analytical mind you can contact me at gleb g l e b at disasteravoidanceexperts.com again gleb at disasteravoidanceexperts.com for any questions about today's show connect with me on linkedin always happy to connect with folks there dr gleb sapurski again dr g l e b t s i p u r s k y and follow me on twitter gleb underscore sapurski again gleb underscore sapurski Fantastic. Well, again, thank you so much, Dr. Sapersky, for sharing your story. And we will see you next time on Coach the Coach Radio. 